magnify your name, Lord, because you are worthy to be praised. We sing hallelujah because you are the one. You are God. You alone are God. And we thank you, God, for the manifestation of your presence in our worship today. We ask, O oh God, now the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Anoint our ears to hear your word. Anoint our lips to proclaim your truth. And anoint our hearts to receive our marching orders. To hear from you. To be responsive to how you nudge us, how you encourage us, how you correct us, how you direct us. Have your way, Holy Spirit, and make us doers of your word and not hearers only, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God for our praise and worship team leading us in our worship. Thank God. Our message for today is Paul's. 12 disciples. Raise your hand if you knew Paul had 12 disciples. I'm the only one to know. Okay, well, you're going to listen then to hear about Paul's 12 disciples. Um, lesson has been read from Acts chapter 19. I don't need to reread that passage, but I will direct your attention back to the opening verses of Acts chapter 19. And we're going to talk about 12 disciples. Now everybody, raise your hand if you know Jesus had 12 disciples. Okay, everybody know that. Well, we're going to learn about Paul's 12 disciples. We meet them in this passage of scripture, Acts chapter 19. And their story is very similar to the story of Apollos, um, which is in chapter 18. On, last week we spoke about Apollos. Um, he was the young man from Egypt who had come there to Ephesus and um, Aquila and Priscilla pulled him aside because he was very educated, very eloquent, but there were some gaps in his knowledge and in his teaching. And they brought him into their circle and they encouraged him. And then Apollos was able to become very effective because he, he, he received the encouragement, he received the correction, and he continued um, to be very effective and excellent in his ministry. So um, if the, the, by the way, all of our sermons, in case you don't know this, but all of our messages are archived on our thirdstreet.org website. So if uh, you want to review a message, not the whole sermon, I mean not the whole service, but uh, the sermon is available uh, for you if you want to hear more about Apollos. That was our message last week. But this week we're in Acts chapter 19. A similar story, but this time there are 12 people. We don't know their names. In fact, we don't know where they came from. We just know that Paul, Apollos was in Corinth. Paul went to Ephesus and he found 12 disciples. It doesn't say he called them. You know, Jesus went and he sought his disciples. He called them and invited them. Paul just found them. But there are 12 of them. We don't know any of their names. But what we do know about them is they helped Paul to make a name for the Lord in Asia. They supported him. They helped him. And I want to suggest to you that the way they helped him was God's way. When I spoke about Apollos in the 18th chapter, um, the three things that I said Paul, uh, the, that made Apollos, got pa Apollos oriented to God's way by his education, by his encouragement, and by his effectiveness. Um, so he was already an educated man. He had already been educated in God's way, but he continued to be educated in God's way. He needed encouragement. He needed correction, but correction and encouragement should go together. Correction without encouragement sometimes is off-putting. And 
Other, on the other hand, sometimes we do so much encouraging that there's no correction, that there's no real critique. And so he accepted both of them, but, they, but encouragement is God's way that we encourage one another when we're engaged in God's way. And then the effectiveness. If we do it God's way, we know we're going to be effective. And we should expect to be effective. What's the point of doing it if you're not going to be effective? But you're going to be effective if you do it God's way. And that is to open the door for God to have the leeway, for God to do what God... Sometimes God is just asking you to line things up so that God can come in and do what needs to be done. And so um, we want to show how these 12 disciples of Paul also followed this education, encouragement, and effectiveness pathway to doing ministry God's way. Now, doesn't tell us about their place of origin or their level of education, but what we know about them without any doubt is that they were prepared to engage in questions and answers, in dialogue. Paul questioned them, and then he instructed them in the way of the Lord. Um, sometimes the most effective approach that we can take to education is to teach and encourage people to ask the right questions. Because I believe that if you ask a question, that will help you to learn. Now, some people are scared to ask a question. They're either afraid because they're shy or they're afraid that somebody will think they're ignorant or think they're stupid because they ask a question. But here, we see that Paul asked them questions, and they respond. They answered. They had an answer. Now, it might not have been the best answer, but it was an answer. That's why when I work with the little ones, Sometimes they give the wrong answer, but you just keep, you say, okay, no, this is the right answer. But at least keep trying. At least don't sit there and just say, oh, I'm scared to ask a question. I'm scared. No, they engaged in question and answer. That meant that they were open to learning. They were open to advancing in their education. And so Paul met them. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They were like, we didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. So they not only had questions, and they were not only willing to answer, they, they were willing to tell the truth. See, <clears throat> if the teacher had to ask you a question, you ought to tell the truth. Because don't act like you know and you don't know. Not unless you're taking a class where there's no test. Now, if there's no test, then I guess you can pretend like you know. But this is about life. So why would you pretend like you know when you don't know and you need to know so you can live? So they answered, we, what baptism did you receive? We received John's baptism. And then Paul was able to explain to them about the difference. John's baptism, John baptized Jesus. So they would not put down John's baptism. John baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. It was a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism that says, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm baptized and I confess my sin. But they had not received the baptism of fire by the Holy Spirit. So he explained to them about Jesus. They listened to Paul and then they received baptism in the name of of the Lord Jesus. Uh, so it just says they received baptism. It, it, it sounds like they were baptized in water, but doesn't, it just doesn't mention water. It says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then it says when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They had said they didn't know about the Holy Spirit. Well, they found out because they were willing to engage Paul's questions and to give honest answers. And I'm saying that's education God's way. 
that you're willing to engage questions and you're willing to give answers. You're willing to tell the truth. You're willing to be honest about what you know and what you don't know so you can be taught and so you can advance in your knowledge and advance in your learning. It doesn't help us if we just pretend like we know and we don't because then we persist in error and we don't want to do error. We want to do education and enlightenment. So Paul was able to instruct them in the way of the Lord. We also want to point out that these 12 disciples illustrate some important things to us about encouragement. And I'm going to keep repeating encouragement because encouragement is a very important part of our relationship in the church. And people in churches so easily become discouraged that I think we need to do, we need to practice and learn more about encouragement because we got so many discouraged people. So we need to work on encouragement. We already got a PhD in discouragement. So we need to go to school and learn how to do encouragement. So let's see what this word teaches us about encouragement. These 12 disciples that Paul found, baptized them, corrected their teaching, and laid hands on them so they received the Holy Spirit. It says these disciples listened to Paul's teaching for three months. So for three months, he went to the synagogue, and they were with him in the synagogue for those three months. What I want to show you there, and I'll show you how this connects with encouragement. Some people will encounter ministry and they'll get their excitement or their blessing and then you don't never see them again. These 12, when Paul blessed them and taught them, they stayed with him. They hung in there. So for three months, 90 days, do you know how many people will join a church and you don't even see them for nine days? They might come back the next week. I'm talking about people who joined the church. And it doesn't take a week for them to get discouraged or mad or go to somewhere else or decide they're not, for whatever reason, they're not going to stay with it. Maybe two weeks. And then you don't see them again. Okay? These disciples stayed with Paul for three months. He's teaching in the synagogue. And they are with him in the synagogue. So what happened when Paul was teaching in the synagogue, um, he, he was very bold and very confident, and he was giving interaction. His teaching style was question and answer. He was giving convincing arguments about the kingdom of God. But what happened was the people in the synagogue began to close their mind. Well, I won't say they began. Some of them had closed minds in the first place. They refused to believe, and they publicly slandered the way. So it's one thing if you have a closed mind, you don't want to hear it. It's another thing if you, you know, you're a tough cookie, so you refuse to believe. But then they went out of their way to slander what Paul was saying. That's the difference. It's one thing to just sit on it and act like, okay, whatever, whatever. But then to go out and say things, falsehoods, and try to distort and discourage others based on what Paul was saying. The Bible says they slandered the way. As a result, Paul left them. That move is called shaking the dust. He's like, Okay, I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to teach you. I've been here for three months, and this is the attitude y'all got. See ya. Sayonara. So Paul left the synagogue, and then he took the disciples with him and continued in Tyrannus Lecture Hall. So he went from the synagogue. He, this is similar to what Paul did when they were in the synagogue and then he went to the house next door. So this time, he went to a lecture hall. Now, I don't know if he rented it out 
And if you, it's interesting what the commentators have to say about this. They say that Paul lectured in Tyrannus Lecture Hall at the time of day when the lecturers were taking their siesta. Now, I, I don't know where you get all that, but if you, you look this verse up in the commentary, and it's like, so he was there from 12 to 3 or something. Well, it doesn't tell you what time. It doesn't matter what time. He was in the lecture hall. He left the synagogue. He said, let me go to the lecture hall. The lecture hall. The lecture hall. The people who lecture, that's going to put me to sleep. <laughs> lecture. But Paul went to the lecture hall, and he continued these conversations for two years. One interesting thing about that, he lasted three months in the synagogue, but he was able to teach for two years in the lecture hall. So it sounds like to me the lecture hall audience was more hospitable than the faith audience. That his ideas got a better reception in the lecture hall than they did in the church. Not the church, the synagogue, but you get what I'm saying. So the disciples stayed with him those two years in the lecture hall, they did not close their minds. They did not refuse to believe. And they did not slander the way of the Lord. I'm talking about the 12 disciples. They protected Paul from harm. They listened. They sat with Paul for two years and three months. And Paul encouraged them. Now, I want you to, um, on your own, if you read the rest of this chapter, there's a story about a riot that arose in Ephesus. And it had to do with the fact that people in Ephesus worship idols. And the idols are made out of silver. And so if people stop buying the idols to worship, then that put the silversmith out of business. See, it's always an economic factor when people do wrong and do injustice, and do oppression. There's always an economic issue there. And so it's like, OK, we're losing money because these people are talking about God and about Christianity, and the people are not worshiping the gods that we're making out of silver. So there was this riot. And it was a big uproar, and the people shouting that they uh, worship this uh, Artemis, their god Artemis. And so what happened was Paul was going to go challenge them, and the disciples were like, no, Paul, you don't get yourself killed. Don't get up in front of these people. These people are riled up. This is a full-scale riot. So they kind of pulled him back, and then they were able to get justice because the accusation against Paul really was not fair. Paul was not the one who was putting the silversmiths out of business. But sometimes when you're doing right, you're the one that gets blamed when stuff goes wrong. And so these disciples protected Paul from harm. And if, when you get to the first verse of Acts chapter 20, it says, When the riot was over, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and said goodbye, and left for the province of Macedonia. So he left because it was time for him to go to his next um, mission, place of mission and ministry. But he encouraged them. He didn't just walk away. He encouraged them. He, he expressed his appreciation for them. But I want to suggest to you that Paul's encouragement of the 12 disciples was mutual. The 12 disciples encouraged him by sticking with him because he was going through adversity. He's trying to preach the word. He's trying to teach the people. He's trying to challenge the ideologies and the false uh, theologies of his time. But the 12 disciples, if he didn't encounter anybody else to be there, those 12 disciples are going to be there in the synagogue and they're going to be there in the lecture hall. And so by their presence, by their presence, they encouraged him. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that People who are in leadership also need encouragement. 
Because when leaders get discouraged, it has an even greater, it can have an even greater impact than when the members get discouraged. Okay, and so I want to suggest to you, I'm, and, and maybe, maybe I'm making too much of this, but I'm just impressed by the fact that the disciples came every day to the synagogue for three months. They came every day to the lecture hall for two years. And so they gave Paul that much audience. They listened to Paul. They supported Paul. And then when Paul was in danger, they looked out for Paul. And so that's encouragement. You know, encouragement doesn't only come by words. Encouragement comes by your presence. It comes by your participation. It comes by your energy. You don't always have to say, be encouraged, be encouraged, be encouraged. You can encourage others by your gesture, by your body language. There's so many ways that you can encourage. So we don't get exact words from them, but we know that Paul, we can assume that Paul was encouraged because he knew his 12 disciples were going to be there when he was speaking in the synagogue, when he was in the company of people with closed minds and people who didn't know any better than to slander the way of the Lord, he was able to withstand because he knew he could count on his 12 disciples. Thirdly and finally, We have effectiveness. Chapter 19, verse 10 through 12, shows us the effectiveness of Paul's ministry in the company of the 12 disciples who participated in his preaching and healing ministry. If you look at verse 10, we're back on, still on Acts chapter 19, verse 10. It says, everyone living in the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the Lord's word. Now, the continent of Asia as we know it in the maps that, or even the globe, um, Asia is a huge continent. In fact, it's the largest continent, right? But I don't know if it means the whole Asia, including the Chinese and all the, the, but Asia, let's say Asia that's in the Bible map is still a big territory. It says all the people heard the word. And I want to suggest to you, if all the people in Asia heard the word, heard the gospel, it was because those disciples got busy. Because it doesn't say that Paul preached to everybody in Asia, but it says everybody in Asia heard the word. So I'm just saying, if you put two plus two together, if Paul was teaching and preaching and these 12 disciples were learning and taking it in, and if everybody heard the Lord's word, everybody, the Jews and the Greeks in Asia, if everybody heard the word, it's because the Ministry of the disciples was effective. Now, it does, you, you can challenge me on that and say, well, don't say that the 12 disciples, but it says that the word got out and that everybody heard it. And I want to suggest to you, that's the whole point of discipleship is to get the word out. And see, what happens in our current climate, if we do, even when we do focus on um, discipleship and spirituality is all about me. It's really just another, for many of us, just another program of self-realization. And that's all good. You know, be yourself. Be your best self. Be your greatest self. All that is good. But the purpose of discipleship is not just self-fulfillment. It's fulfillment of God's will. And you will find personal fulfillment when you do God's will. God's way. And so don't just get stuck on my fulfillment. You need to focus on what does God want me to do. And so it wasn't just the fact that he discipled these 12 people. They had a mission to accomplish. And they accomplished it without making a name for themselves. That's the other thing we can't do can't accomplish anything without being recognized. 
And it's okay to be recognized. That's part of encouragement, is recognizing people. But is that the only reason why you're doing it? To be recognized? Or does the recognition just come as a bonus when you've done the thing, which is to discern and to obey the will of God? So, obviously, obviously, the will of God is for everybody to hear the word. And that's what happened. And so they were effective. And nobody gets the credit but God. That's God's way. So the effectiveness was how many people heard the Lord's word. But then there's another proof of effectiveness. And this is verses 11 and 12. God, God, was performing unusual miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons he had used were taken to the sick, and their diseases were driven away, and the evil spirits would go out of them. Now, that's the supernatural. Actually, it's supernatural is that everybody heard the word of the Lord. That's supernatural. But even more supernatural is how God performed miracles through Paul. And so what this is saying, handkerchiefs, I, I don't want to make this sound too bad, but it has to do with skin. Okay? And so the things that had touched him... He had a handkerchief. If he had used the handkerchief, that means it had contact with his skin, then that handkerchief had his touch in it. And they would use that, they would take that handkerchief, and the handkerchief would be taken to people who were sick or people who were demon possessed, and they would be healed by the handkerchief. Now, I don't know what to say about the apron. But let's just say apron was some kind of garment. I don't know. I mean, you know, we think of an apron. An apron is what you wear in the kitchen. I don't know what an apron was. But it was something that Paul wore. It touched his skin. They would take the apron that Paul had worn and take it to the person needing healing. Take it to the person who was demon possessed and they would be healed. And, they, and so that's supernatural. Now, you can take that and do different things with it. You can sell blessed cloths. That's a, I think Reverend Ike used to do that. You can sell them. But the thing is, if, you know, if, if it's blessed, I mean, if, if it's going, you know, well, I just think if you're going to do that, you better be rolling like Paul. See, Paul was healing people. That's why, because he had this healing power that, because see, people tried to play. We'll talk about this next week. People tried to play with the power that Paul had. Don't play with God. Because it wasn't about Paul, it was about God. It's just that God was operating through Paul, and God was operating so effectively through Paul that even his garment had power, residual power in it. And so they could take the garment to places where maybe Paul didn't have access and people were healed. That's the supernatural. That's effectiveness. You can't fake that. You can't manufacture that. It is only when you do things God's way that that will be the manifestation. God was saying, okay, y'all doing it my way. Let me show you my power. And so that's the place where the church wants to be. We want to be at the place where there's no limit to what God can do. And where if God wants to operate through a piece of cloth, that feet, feet through a handkerchief, then God, you do your thing. Unusual miracles. It's your way. It's your will. You want to bless people. You don't have to guess whether God wants to bless people or not. And so instead of talking about people, maybe we need to 
And I mean, yes, pray for people, but pray for God to make a way for them to find what they're longing for. As many times as people act up, it's because there's some kind of pain, there's some kind of deficit that they can't do anything about. And the only piece of it you get is their behavior. But if they could get healing, if they could get deliverance, and they have a supernatural need for it, do you have an answer for them? And the answer is, let's do it God's way. If we do it God's way, then we can be effective. Effectiveness is the supernatural result we get when we do ministry God's way. Now, in this story, what sets these disciples apart is that Paul laid his hands on them and they all received the Holy Spirit. But receiving the Holy Spirit still didn't make them noteworthy in terms of their names or their accomplishments. It's just that together, because the Holy Spirit was operating, they were able to receive the proper teaching. They were able to give and receive encouragement. And they were able to be effective with Paul. Because I would believe, okay, it says that, let's give you an example. It says that they took the handkerchiefs and the aprons to people who needed healing. Well, who actually did that? Probably the 12 disciples. See, it doesn't say that. But somebody had to take. Paul's handkerchief and give it to the people who needed it. Otherwise, if Paul did it, they don't need the handkerchief if they got Paul. So somebody took the handkerchief, but guess what else? That person had to have faith or else they looking like a fool. If I, if I was like, Okay, well, here's this handkerchief. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but here's this handkerchief. No, you, the disciples like, this handkerchief came. This handkerchief is blessed. It's a blessing in this handkerchief. We've seen the power of God operate. Take this handkerchief in faith. It was faith. It wasn't like, ugh. It was faith. Yeah, this came from Paul, and Paul got it. Paul got this power from God. You see, so I'm saying, I'm suggesting you the 12 disciples played a role in taking, making this system, God's system, work because God knew that it was more than just Paul could do by himself. So at least he had 12, but 12 was enough. You know, sometimes we obsess over numbers. We say, oh, we don't have hundred, we don't have a thousand, we don't have twenty thousand, because you know, I, I got friends, I have students who pass the thousands, okay, and so that's all good, I mean, the more, literally, the more the merrier, if you got thousands, that's good, but don't look down on the numbers, because Jesus had 12, Paul had 12, and if you got 12 people, who's hitting on all the cylinders, checking all the boxes, you got something going for the Lord. They witnessed to the whole nation, the whole province, with 12 people. So, I want us to be encouraged when we do it God's way. We don't have to always crunch the numbers. We don't have to always look at the numbers, be discouraged by the numbers. How many people are discouraged by numbers? You know the most discouraging number that we use in our common uh, language in this nation is the word minority. You almost never hear me say minority. Because you know minority ain't nothing but a number. But the way it gets used, oh, you the minority. You the minority this and the minority that. The last time I checked, the majority shrinking and the minority is increasing. So it's just a number, but it's a number that can put you in a certain frame of mind. 
And so as long as I convince you that you're the minority, you don't even have a sense to look around yourself and see that you're in the most numbers because you won't have a majority mindset. By the same token, sometimes people have a majority mindset and they're the only one. But they think that makes them large and in charge. So don't be deceived by numbers because God's math works different from people's math, right? And we want to do God's math God's way. And that is to trust God. Lord, take the numbers. Help us. First of all, this is how God's math works. Then I'll stop with this. You be faithful in a few things. God's math. Be faithful in a few things. And then you be positioned to do greater things. Some of us want to do greater. We don't want to do fewer. We want to bypass fewer. But God said, no, be faithful in a few things, and then you will be elevated to bigger things. So let's be faithful in, instead of despising the few, be faithful with the few. And if you're part of the faithful few, then be faithful. Because faithful is a more important word than few. Faithful. Faithful. These disciples were faithful in education, faithful in encouragement, and they were faithful in effectiveness for God. Lord God, we thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, for your faithful people here at Third Street Church. Thank you, God, for your faithful people here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., Thank you, God, for your faithful people in this United States of America. Thank you, God, for your faithful people in this world. God, we're not talking about the numbers. We're talking about the faithfulness. Show us, God. Show us how to do the kind of teaching and learning and discipling, oh God, that's exactly in line with the Great Commission that said we should make disciples of all nations. Show us the curriculum. Show us what to teach them. Show us how to teach people obedience to your voice and to your way. Show us, God, how to teach transparency and honesty and integrity so we won't try to fake it till we make it or pretend we know stuff we don't know. But we'll be open and honest and questions and answers and learning and growing, oh God, and encouraging one another as we grow and as we learn and as we're challenged, that we will not be closed-minded. Save us, God, from the wrath of closed-minded people. Save us, God, from the spiritual demise of people who refuse to believe. There were places where Jesus couldn't heal because people refused to believe. Save us, God, from the spiritual negativity of people who won't believe. God, we pray that we will never say or do anything that will bring slander or disgrace to your way. We want to honor your way. We want to do your way. We want to be in the way. Be in the way where you can work in us and through us and not have to work around us. Oh, God, make us effective, we pray, in this church. Give us an openness to the move of your spirit. And God, we pray that you will give us an openness to seeing the kinds of miracles that will bring healing and deliverance to people's lives, that will set people free, that will give people what they need in order to really move into the place where they can be disciples and be used of you. God, to discover their gifts, to discover their ministry, to put their talents to use. Heal our discouragement. Help us, God, to become effective because we know 
that the excellency of the power is not in the earthen vessel. We have this power. It's not the vessel. It's the one who poured into us. So pour into us so that we can be poured out, God, in a way that will be a blessing. Not making a name for ourselves, but making a name for the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us that blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to close with our invitation to discipleship. I don't know if our praise team has a song that they would like to bring to us. The while they're looking. Um, I just... Always want to say the altar is open. We invite you to come, invite you to stand. Today may be your day to make that commitment, commitment of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or your commitment. I'm already a Christian, but I want to be a disciple. I want to learn. I want to be like these people who were learning and encouraging and becoming effective in the way you live your life for God. We want to pray that prayer with you. And as we stand together, as you're able, I cannot be idle. We're going to sing a verse and chorus of that, and we invite you to come. I cannot be idle for Jesus, says go, and work 